λοιπόν, να σας καλησπέρισω. Ε, όλους σας ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ που βρίσκεστε εδώ όλοι σήμερα. Θα δώσω το λόγο στην Αλεξία και θα σας πούμε, σας εξηγήσουμε έτσι λίγο πώς θα το κάνουμε. Έλα, Αλεξία. Uh, now we're switching to, to English. Um, dear President of the Hellenic Psychological Society, dear colleagues, dear friends of the Cognitive Psychology Division, uh, welcome. Um, it is wonderful to, to see many familiar faces here. Uh, we gather this evening because we have the, the great honor to have with us Professor Paul Harris, uh, who is willing to talk to us about his new book and his research on the development of children's thought, on learning, on imagination, and so much more. Uh, Professor Harris, thank you so much for uh, generously accepting our invitation. It is an enormous joy and privilege to, to have you here with us. And um, before, before we give the floor to the president of the Hellenic Psychological Society, Professor Macris, to say a few words about our distinguished guest, we want to say that this meeting will take place entirely in English and it will have the form of an interview. After a couple of questions that we will address to Professor Harris to sparkle a conversation, there will be time for a more interactive exchange of ideas and thoughts. The floor will be open for your questions, for your thoughts, which uh, you can either post directly or, if you prefer, send them in the chat of the meeting. So, Professor McCris, uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Natasha. Good evening to all. Uh, thanks to technology, we have the opportunity to listen and talk to Paul Harris today. Dear coordinators of the Cognitive Psychology Division of the Hellenic Psychological Society, dear Alexia, dear Natasha, thank you very much for organizing this interesting meeting. Dear colleagues, dear friends, welcome to this event. I have known Paul Harris for many, many years, mainly through studying his research and ideas on child development. A few years ago, however, I had the chance to meet him in person at some conferences in Europe and USA. And I consider it is important. I'm yes. Having trouble if people are also having difficulty, or if it's just me. I can hear you, Paul. I, I, there is a problem, I think. I don't know whether it's mine with my connection. No, I think it's uh, with Paul Harris' connection, the problem. I think that uh, you know Paul Harris, yeah, that uh, all you know Paul Harris, so I will not present uh, his CV in detail. If I did, it would take too much time. So I will limit myself to presenting only some information about him. Paul, do you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Paul Harris, after 20 years at Oxford, where he was professor of developmental psychology and fellow of uh, St. John's College, he migrated to Harvard University, where he has been teaching developmental psychology in the Graduate School of Education for the last 22 years. He is a fellow of the British Academy and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. His book, Trusting What You Are Told, How Children Learn from Others, won the Cognitive Developmental Society Book Award in 2013 and the Eleanor Maccoby Book Award from the American Psychological Association in 2014. In addition to these awards, he has also received awards from the Association for Psychological Science, the American Psychological Association, the Cognitive Developmental Society, the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and the European Society for Developmental Psychology. Moreover, he was a member of the editorial board of Child Development and Human Development, and he was the editor of the British Journal of Developmental Psychology. It is also worth mentioning that during the last eight years, he has published about 100 papers in the field of child development in high-impact international journals. 
I will stop at this point in order to give Paul himself time to talk to us about his ideas on the, on the occasion of the release of his new book entitled, entitled Child Psychology in 12 Questions. Dear Paul, it is a great honor for us to have you with us today. It is also a great pleasure for me to see you, to see you again, even if only on camera. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nikos. So the idea for this meeting was inspired by the edition of your latest uh, book, Child Psychology in 12 Questions, uh, admittedly a fascinating book for its thought-provoking scientific content, and at the same time for its simplicity and accessibility by all kinds of interested readers, students, parents, scientists. Would you like to tell us a few words about the book, its conception, and its story? So this book um, is based on a course that I've given more or less since I arrived at Harvard in 2001. It's an <clears throat> introductory course on child development, and the students in question are typically master students in education, um, who come from a variety of backgrounds. Some have done chemistry, some have done history, some have done education, psychology, um, but for the most part, um, they have not done any in-depth work in child psychology. Um, so I've taught it for, as I say, for many years uh, since I've been at Harvard, and as as time went on, I began to write up some notes, some guidelines with respect to each topic and to circulate them among the students to supplement my uh, lecture presentation. And I gradually took the habit of updating these notes each year to the point where I eventually felt that um it was time to stop it was time to stop tinkering with these notes uh, forever trying to improve them and simply seek a publisher and happily oxford university press um, was willing to to publish them and um, gave me some help and guidance in terms of the format um, um, and i'm happy to say that although it's early days, the, the book is to be translated into um, Mandarin, in fact. Um, I think, uh, let me see, Romanian and a couple of other, other languages that I'm forgetting. So at any rate, um, I have, I have um, fantasies of students on a train from, from Beijing to Shanghai um, with their book, with the book in their, in their backpack and occasionally getting it out to read. So this is my fantasy. Very nice. Um, it's a truly uh, reader friendly book mm -hmm. and um, reading it, uh, one has the sensation, the the impression that uh, even uh, very complex uh, thoughts and concepts, uh, you make them sound very, very uh, uh, easy. Um, during uh, your scientific career, you have approached the study of child development from uh, a variety of perspectives, uh, albeit interconnected perspectives. You have produced a wealth of uh, studies that uh, illuminated um, in a very um, fine-grained resolution various dimensions of uh, children's thought. Um, a beautiful, very beautiful sentence in the introduction of your book captures, we believe, the, the nature and the quality of your work and really um, resonates with what we also think um, developmental research uh, should be like. I cite from your book, uh, understanding the minds of children is not an enterprise for the impatient or the fast moving. It calls for a willingness to linger 
Um, would you like to share with us uh, what the motivating force in your scientific inquiry has been and perhaps what this lingering has taught you um, about child development, uh, but also perhaps about how the approach or the stance uh, we as researchers adopt while studying children uh, might shape our understanding of development and our theories. So maybe it helps a little bit to trace the development of my thinking. Um, so <clears throat> I suppose um, the starting point was really um, doctoral research on babies. And at that particular time, this was in the, um, the late 60s. Um, there was very little research, certainly in the United Kingdom, on babies. And so I remember um, visiting a laboratory in Scotland run by um, Dr. Schaffer. That was possibly the only other laboratory in the whole of the United Kingdom. And so in some ways it was very exciting because there were no, there were no other there was not much to read. <laughs> there was just the opportunity to do research and to feel that you were in some sense in undiscovered, unexplored territory. And um, the difficulty, though, of pursuing work on babies was that um, it's quite, you, you really need a research laboratory you need research assistance, you need a steady flow of babies. And when I started to teach, um, I found that it was somewhat easier and more practicable to work with older children, <clears throat> with school age children, because you can go to the schools rather than have the babies come to you. At any rate, I guess the next major step was to, to work in Holland where um, the department that I belong to was connected to a residential uh, treatment centre for children with emotional difficulties. And many of the psychology students that I was teaching had those more practical and clinical concerns of helping young children. And I think they were slightly frustrated at my lectures because they didn't seem very practical. They didn't offer much help in terms of how to intervene with troubled children. And so in order to accommodate the students a little bit, I began to think about ways in which my more cognitive developmental approach could be adapted to their particular concerns. And that led to um, a line of research that I still continue, I still think about and try to contribute to which is the idea that as children get older, they become more insightful, more cognizant of their own emotions and the emotions of other people. So the broad theme of children's understanding of emotion. And um, I'm happy to say that these days, thanks to collaborators, especially Francisco Pons in, in, in um, Norway, um, there's a simple test uh, for measuring children's understanding of emotion now translated into 20 plus languages. Um, and it's proving quite a useful tool for those people who want to, for example, conduct an intervention and to see what impact the intervention has had, or people who want to compare insights into emotion in different cultural settings or in different socio-economic backgrounds. <clears throat> well, I guess the next step was that um, my particular line of thinking about children's understanding of emotion began to blend in with a broader preoccupation in child psychology with children's um, theories of mind as they came to be called. A lot of that work was focused on children's understanding of thinking and knowing as opposed to 
emotions that I was looking at. On the other hand, there are important connections because children's <clears throat> understanding of emotion has to be bolstered and informed by their understanding of what people know and what people think. <clears throat> at any rate, in the in the context of thinking about uh, children's insights into the minds of other people, whether it be the feelings, the emotions, the thoughts, the knowledge of other people, I was led to think about children with autism um, provoked by some excellent colleagues in the United Kingdom, um, <clears throat> including Uta Friss, Simon Baron Cohen, uh, and Alan Leslie. And one of the things they emphasized was that on the one hand, children with autism have a rather limited imagination. In fact, one of the early diagnostic signs is a lack of pretend play. <clears throat> on the other hand, when we look at those children, of course, we know that their conceptual development in various domains is, is problematic and difficult, and their relationships with other people are problematic and difficult. So that led me to think a little bit more carefully about the possible relationship between the early development of the imagination and children's subsequent cognitive development. And when I look back at the literature, um, if anything, the implication was rather negative with respect to the contribution that the child's imagination might make. So, for example, if you look at two very different figures, Freud and Piaget, they tend to imply that children's imagination is a sort of short-lived excursion into the fantastical and irrational and freely associative and the better, the more they become objective and rational, um, the more mature they are. Well, that didn't actually fit very well at all with what with these observations of my UK colleagues on on the development of children with autism, because these children suffered from um, limitations in their pretend play, with apparent links to subsequent cognitive difficulties. <clears throat> so anyway, to cut a long story short, that set me thinking about children's imagination and more specifically their early pretend play. And together with Bob Havanagh, a US visitor at, at the time in Oxford, we conducted a number of studies looking at the extent to which a two-year-old or a three-year-old can make sense of another person's pretend actions and in some ways watch their partner and fill in the mental gaps realize that when an empty teapot is lifted and tipped um, that pretend tea comes out of the teapot in some ways a very pedestrian observation but i it, the more i thought about it the more i realized that it's actually an important one in implying that children, children's imagination is infused with all sorts of everyday knowledge about how the world works. At any rate, um, in, the, in the light of that work on pretend play, I ended up writing a book about um, children's imagination more broadly and the way in which children's imagination is not a hindrance but a contributor, a benefit for their cognitive development in enabling them to think about things that could have happened but didn't happen, uh, ways that people might have behaved and perhaps should have behaved but didn't. So in other words, um, they use their imagination um, to engage in causal thinking, to engage in moral thinking, and in, I think, um, it's fair to say that we see the same um, processes in adults. Well, the next step, and, and I'm bringing this rather extended saga, hopefully to a close in a couple of minutes. Um, the next step was to think about um, relationship between language and imagination. And I gradually started to um, realize that 
I had neglected that in my book about the imagination, but it was very important. And more specifically that often when children hear a narrative, a story, it could be, uh, it could be a fictional story, it could be a historical narrative. They rely on their imagination, so to speak, to conjure up within their mind's eye the sequence of events that's being described. In other words, there's a rather close, intimate relationship between children's ability to understand language that's not about the here and now, but about the past or the future or the possible and their imagination. And that then led me to think more carefully about how children learn. And a lot of work in the 20th century, largely due, I think, to Piaget, not exclusively, perhaps to Montessori and others as well, has pictured the child as a hands-on learner. The idea is that the child learns best when they are confronted by the actual world, able to touch, see, manipulate the actual world. And there's a lot of truth to that claim, but it's also, I think, inadequate as a characterization of children's intellectual development in general, because there are various aspects of the known world that you can't touch, you can't see. Um, so if you think for a moment about the past, about history, this is something you often do, I think, in Greece, um, so if a child is to learn about the past, this is not something they can do in a hands-on fashion. It's not as if you can give them a direct exposure and a direct experience of the past. The way that they learn about the past is typically via language, via other people's testimony, via narratives, via historical texts and so forth. So there's one example of where children are not hands-on learners, but testimony-based learners. The same, I think, is true of uh, many aspects of science. So if we think about COVID virus, most young children over the age of three or four these days are aware of the existence of the COVID virus. Well, how do they know about the COVID virus? Not by direct experience, they've never seen it, they've never touched it, they've not tasted it. It's because it, it is introduced to them by parents and teachers um, who make sense for them of the various precautions they're expected to take in terms of wearing masks and so forth. So young, here's another example of where young children um, are learning about things that are intangible, invisible, but nonetheless important. Um, so history, science, and last but not least, you know, not all children, but many children are exposed to religious claims about um, unseen gods or the future possibility of an afterlife or the possibility of some earlier life, depending upon which religion we're talking about. And for better or for worse, children accept these claims and sometimes lead their life in light of the implications of those claims. So there's a third example of where you can't think of the child or you shouldn't only think of the child as a hands-on learner. You have to accept that children are learning from other people's testimony. And just one final remark, which is that in some ways, although Piaget emphasized children's hands-on learning and implied that this was a sort of natural developmental disposition. There's another aspect of very young children which fits in with the idea that they learn via testimony. So I'm sure most of you have spent time with young children and know that they ask a lot of questions. They start doing that um, from the age of about 18 months and by the age of 30 months they don't only ask rather simple factual questions about what and where and who 
they start to ask for explanations. They ask how and why questions. And if you look, if naturalistic data suggests that the average parent is going to be bombarded with thousands and thousands of questions in the first uh, three to four years of life. So there's an illustration of the fact that children are equipped to be, um, as it were, what can we say, exploiters of testimony. They seek out the testimony of other people, particularly when they encounter something that puzzles them or when there's a gap in their knowledge. And so fairly recently, I've also been interested in um, working with students studying the emergence of questions, both in English speaking children and in uh, children speaking other languages. Um, so just coming back to the question of lingering, which is where we started. <laughs> um, I suppose, I suppose in some ways I'm just defending my own ability, inability to move on. Um, that's to say the fact that I've circled back repeatedly to themes that, that continue to be relevant. I gave the example of, I gave the example of children's um, understanding of emotion, still, still working on that. Um, and more broadly, the way in which um, children children use their imagination and language, still working on that. So, I, if anything, it's it's a somewhat defensive um, remark about the way in which I seem in, unable, un, incapable of moving on. I'm standing there, uh, looking, so to speak. Thank you so much for sharing all all that. With us, it's very inspiring. Um, in fact, you have answered many of the questions we had thought asking you. So, <laughs> um, listening to you, I would like you mentioned that um, language is um, practically a prerequisite for um, for learning through testimony of others, so the wo words of others. Um, so, would you say? Uh, would you see? Um, a developmental uh, continue trend or change um, from learning by experimentation and uh, and hands-on learning to what what would the the interplay of language to to both ways of learning would be according to you? So. I mean, from if, I think if we look at it developmentally, um, we see infants and toddlers engage in hands-on learning. But I would say almost as early, uh, uh, we also see children engaging in testimony-based learning. So the two modes operate side by side. Some of the interesting questions um, <clears throat> um, arise when children are confronted by by situations in which um, there's a conflict between those two sources of information. So, for example, they may draw their own conclusions from their first-hand observations, but they may be told um, by an informant um, on the basis of that informant's testimony um, but what they see or what they think they see is incorrect or inadequate. I think it's fair to say that in, in the research on testimony, we have only begun to think about how the two streams of information interconnect. But I do think it's a very important line of research. Um, so let me just give you one very brief example of of how we're trying to do that at the moment. So, um, I suppose I'm, it, it, the, the study has been inspired by thinking about the way that science works, where you have different investigators disagreeing with each other and hopefully, ultimately, adjudicating their disagreement by empirical observation. So, here's an example of where there's testimonial conflict that's ultimately re resolved by empirical investigation. So 
I mean, what we've done is to give children little vignettes in which we invite them to think about two people who make different claims. So one person claims, for example, that a ball is going to sink when it's dropped in the water. And another person tells the child, no, it won't sink, it's going to float. And we then <clears throat> ask the child to tell us whether um, only one of these people is right or whether both of them could in principle be right. And then in the third step, the children see that the ball, for example, floats, and then we ask them to assess who actually was right in the end. Um, and to summarize where we are at the moment, we find that younger children faced with these conflicting informants have trouble in realizing that both people in principle could be right. They tend to, as it were, prematurely um, affirm the truth of one informant or the other informant. Whereas when we talk to nine and 10 year olds, they're much more um, capable of acknowledging that until that we have more evidence, this person could be right and that person could be right. And then when the evidence comes in, they, like the younger children, readily recognize that one person is proven wrong and one person is proven, proven correct. So, so far we found this age change with children in the United States and in, with children in, in China. And we are trying to, we, we plan to pursue this line of investigation, not least because, as I say, it's, it's an intriguing um, conjunction of um, this line of work on children's um, reactions to other people's testimony and their reactions to empirical um, first-hand observations. Um, yeah, so there's, that's one on illustration of, of, of how they can be brought together. But I, I should emphasize that it's very early days. We don't have any kind of, we don't have any kind of overview of that ultimate relationship. I guess I could just say one more thing, which is that we do find when we talk to children of about from about five or six years of age upwards we ask them about their belief in various familiar scientific entities about germs oxygen electricity and so forth and all of them are very confident that those scientific entities exist We also ask them about various familiar religious entities, God, the soul, and so forth. And what is interesting is that, of course, depending upon their upbringing, children are also confident about those invisible religious entities. On the other hand, when you look closely at the data, there's a subtle difference in the sense that children are a bit more confident about the scientific entities than the religious entities in terms of confidence. And we're still trying to figure out why that is. Um, one possibility is that, well, the scientific entities are ultimately empirically decidable. Um, on the other hand, you could counter that by saying, well, as I was mentioning earlier, it's not as if young children have any empirical access to germs or oxygen. And so it's puzzling as to why they are somewhat more confident about the scientific entities. And we're tempted to think that this it ultimately it goes back to the fact that they're in a society where differential confidence is transmitted to them by parents, by the community. Um, I may say that these results um, we found not just in the United States, uh, but we've also found them in religious 
highly religious country such as Iran. So if you talk to Iranian children and Iranian parents, you also find that there's somewhat more confidence in scientific entities than, than religious entities. So there's another example, I think, of where um, it, we need to think carefully about the role on the one hand of testimony, on the other hand of empirical evidence. But as I say, we don't have a good answer about what the relationship is for the time being. So um, actually this discussion uh, reminds me of an incident with my younger son. When he was around five, six years old, we were discussing various astronomical phenomena as I was doing research at that domain at that time. And we were discussing the shape of the earth, the day-night change, and one day I asked him uh, how day turned into night. He was able to explain the phenomenon with great accuracy and provided a correct scientific explanation. And one could say that he had acquired relevant knowledge. However, at the end, um, he told me with uh, disarming honesty, are you sure, ma'am, that things <laughs> happen this way? Um, I'm not sure for what you're telling me. Um, I see things differently. So, undoubtedly, I, I was a trusted informant. I was his mother. I seemed to talk with confidence for this phenomena, but he wasn't persuaded. So, I wonder if in cases where children's knowledge is, um, intuitive knowledge is so strong, is it enough to trust someone else's testimony to gain knowledge? Or are there uh, limitations that prevent children from surpassing their intuitive experience? Certain, certainly there is exposure to scientific information. As you said, they say that germs exist. Uh, they say that the Earth is a sphere because they listen to adults talk about these invisible entities uh, with confidence. But is it only trust that is what is needed or has it also to do with the ability to construct or flexibly move among different representations and reflect on them? Um, for example, might a child um, also understand that things may appear different than reality or that there are more than one different perspectives? And as you said, one of them may be better than the other. So uh, I think you're asking complicated <laughs> questions. I guess I'm tempted to say that we can find examples of where what the child is told is sufficiently powerful and trusted that it overrides their naive intuitions. Um, but there are, there are also examples, and we see this even with adults, where um, even if they're confronted with expert testimony, which seems to be in a consensus, um, to the extent that it doesn't fit their naive experience, it's rejected and, and not accepted. Um, so I think when we explore this opposition between, as it were, um, naive or, or autonomous intuitions on the one hand and external testimony on the other, um, there's an, there are several different possible outcomes, and I must admit, I don't have a good theory of why it is that sometimes the testimony is the most potent and why it is that sometimes the, the naive um, intuitions are the most potent. I just know that we, you know, we probably here's a case where we need to linger and do more research. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I think uh, we should, uh, I will make a last question and uh, we should open the floor to, uh, to people so they can ask. Uh, um, I, I really love the area of fantasy of your research um, and uh, I was wondering um, what's your opinion um, about uh, our educational system, about schools? Um, do you believe that uh, uh, somehow, and that's what I am I'm asking in reality, what's your opinion on how uh, schools should uh, refocus, refocus their 
curricula and uh, instead of uh, marginalizing uh, children's imagination and fantasy and pretend and all that, um, if they could uh, somehow exploit uh, in a way that uh, they could foster in reality uh, critical abilities like uh, hypothetical thinking, which is a, a part of scientific thinking in reality. Mm. Yes, I think one, one area where the curriculum could be expanded um, is to use children's imagination not simply as a playground, so to speak, or an entertainment, although I'm perfectly happy that it serves those functions, but sometimes it can be harnessed with the idea that children can engage in thought experiments. So we know from the history of science that major conceptual change has been brought about simply by scientists or philosophers thinking about hypothetical situations and realizing that their conclusions about those hypothetical situations run counter to some commonly accepted assumption so you know um Galileo being one of the classic examples of the use of, of thought experiments. But philosophers also employ thought experiments to get people uh, or their colleagues to entertain things that are thinkable, imaginable, um, but probably not necessarily often thought about. So my point, I guess I'm what I'm trying to emphasize here is that because the child's imagination is very much rooted in the child's understanding of reality, when the child uses their imagination to conjure up a hypothetical possibility, that hypothetical possibility is likely to be very plausible because the child's imagination is guided by what they think is likely to happen. So but sometimes what they think is likely to happen is not something that would necessarily occur to them or not necessarily something that they would weigh up in asking themselves whether it, it ought to trigger a revision in the way they think about the way that the world works. And in some ways we do this naturally with children. We say to the child, you know, well, imagine if your sister did that to you, how would you feel? In some ways, that's a thought experiment that we're inviting children to engage in. But if you look at um, if you look at the average um, school curriculum, the idea of taking five, six, seven-year-olds by the hand and saying, "I want you to imagine this particular possibility, whether it's in the with respect to the physical world." or with respect to the world of interpersonal relationships or the biological world, um, I don't think uh, many teachers employ the idea that children have a rich, powerful imagination, which is sufficiently realistic, that it could actually teach them something without them doing any empirical work whatsoever. And here again, I think we run into the idea that children learn best, um, children learn best when they're able to be hands-on explorers. And I'm tempted to say sometimes they don't learn very well when they're able to be hands-on explorers. It's much better to get them to, so to speak, close their eyes and think. Um, but it's a technique that's next to never used, as far as I know, in, in, in ordinary schools. Sorry, I'm muted. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> um, so, um, dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, the floor is yours to uh, to share your thoughts, your questions. Uh,
Anyone? <laughs> there is one question by Mandy, I think. Uh, she raised I can't the say that. I cannot say that, yes. but yes. Yes. Great. Hi. Hi to everybody. Hello. Um, I'm a mediator from Zakynthos, and um, I'm very interested in um, um, this um, uh, possibility uh, to help children uh, be educated in uh, a kind of conflict-free life. Uh, so I was wondering, and I wanted to ask, um, is it possible to help children um, through their imagination, maybe, to believe, uh, uh, to imagine their selves, uh, their family lives, or uh, the society life, uh, in a peaceful way where everybody has his opinion and it's not right or wrong. Always uh, the issue to be solved. Uh, but it's a kind of uh, world it, they could imagine that is a kind of world where uh, there is space for all kind of uh, opinions if uh, they don't hurt, of course. Thank you. Yes, I would say that um, the work I described earlier on children's, um, how children react to people who disagree is a, is a modest, very modest illustration of the kind of situation that you were talking about, presumably where children respectfully listen to people who disagree, um, having s and, and ultimately make some kind of conclusion about which claim is correct. But I suppose it's important to underline the fact that um, the situation that we we're exploring in our experiments is rather simple. In other words, the ball when it drops in the water either floats or sinks, and so it's pretty clear that one person is right and one person is wrong. Whereas I, I'm guessing that the kinds of situations and disagreements that you have in mind are more complicated than that and where it's much more difficult to um, adjudicate between between um, people who disagree. Um, and in that case, it seems to me, um, educators need to allow people to be confronted by disagreement, but, but perhaps to, but perhaps encourage children also to to think carefully about how to go about figuring out who has the more coherent or well defended position so that they see in some sense disagreement being entertained and adjudicated over time not quickly but slowly and that might be a question of a disagreement about history or a policy disagreement, um, a disagreement of a moral nature. So in all these cases, I think it, it a, a sensitive teacher could perhaps help children to see that um, it's going to be that the important thing is to it, the important thing is to think through, how one comes to some kind of conclusion about the relative merits of the opposing points of view, not so much to preemptively judge one person correct and one person wrong or one position correct and one position wrong, but to learn about how to how to best adjudicate. And 
I guess I'm implying also that the adjudication procedures are going to vary dramatically depending upon the kind of intellectual domain that we're that we're talking about. Adjudication in in certain areas of science is very different from adjudication in certain areas of history or certain areas of morality and so forth. I'm not sure if I've answered your question, but I, I'm giving you a kind of um, potted philosophy, I suppose. <laughs> no, it was uh, quite uh, encouraging. Okay. Uh, not only logical, but very encouraging. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, uh, I see Dimitra has her hand up. Yes. Mm. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, Professor Harris, it is my honor. Thank you for being here. So, um, I am a PhD student working on my thesis on theory of mind. Your extensive work on theory of mind has focused on many factors that may affect or explain children's ability to read others' minds. These include the cultural context, imagination, reasoning, and you have also recognized the importance of metacognition and executive functions, etc. So my question is, do you believe that there is one single theory that, in your opinion, explains this complex interplay of all these factors? And what advice would you give to a young researcher who wants to study theory of mind holistically? What a tough question. Um, do I think there's a theory that encompasses all these factors? No, I think, I think what we see are laboratories which differ in their emphasis, some emphasizing cultural aspects, some emphasizing executive function. Um, I mean, I think the good news is, though, that, you know, the theory of mind enterprise is probably 40 years old, I would say, approximately, indeed. One of the pioneers, Joseph Perner, um, tells me that there's going to be a birthday party for uh, Maxi, the early protagonist of the false belief. It's his 40th birthday mm -hmm. in 2023. So there's going to be a, a gathering of theory <laughs> of mind researchers. Um, I think the good news is that over the 40 years, the early assumption that it was, for example, just a question of conceptual development, or that there was some well-formed innate module, has given way to the complexity that you've just described, the various um, competing elements um, that need to be coordinated. I guess if there's one, I mean, I mean, having said that, if there's one particular favorite I, that I would, favorite line of investigation that I would um, emphasize, I think some of the most important work has been the work with deaf children. Um, deaf children who were either born um, uh, to regular hearing families or deaf children born into deaf families and that work has been very important i think in showing that it's really very vital for a young child to be exposed to conversation and of course i'm happy with that result because it bolsters my belief that children learn so much um, via via testimony and the other aspect that I would emphasize is that I think it's also important to look at language, especially um, spontaneous everyday language that children produce, because it, it helps us to figure out the relative importance of certain concepts. So, for example, if we look at the work um, 
that the um, the language corpora that have emerged in the Chaldez database, originally based on the work by Roger Brown looking at children's language acquisition, we can look at these corpora and look at children's use of words like know and think and want. Well, if you look at those corpora, um, what you see is that young children don't often talk about false beliefs. On the other hand, if you look at the research enterprise over the last 40 years, which I think has been very fruitful, but it's nevertheless been highly focused on false beliefs. And yet false belief is a very limited part of children's discussion of other people's mental states. They spend much more time talking about other people's desires and other people's emotions. But you will look in vain if you want to see an, you know, a similar level of effort and conceptual sophistication dedicated to an understanding of children's grasp of those two domains. So I, I, whilst I'm, um, what can I say, um, when I did my thesis, I belonged to a department which was called the Department of Experimental Psychology. And at one point there was a discussion about whether to just call it the Department of Psychology. But there were some elderly professors who felt that we had to insist that we were experimental. Well, yes, OK, I agree. It's important to do experiments. But I also think it's very important to look at the child's ecology, the child's everyday life, to get a sense of what happens rarely and what happens often, and not to zoom in on something which is you know, um, occasional rather than central. And I think up to a point that's happened in the work on theory of mind, it was it was hijacked is a bit of a strong word, but it was very much inspired by a clever experimental work to the neglect of a careful look at the child's ecology. So sorry, a rather long winded answer, but you you hear me expressing my prejudices. Thank you very much. Nikos, yes. Well, Paul, you have already studied various aspects of child development. If someone asked you to say which aspect of child development needs further investigation in order to get a clearer picture of it, what uh, would you say? Um, I think I think I would say that what is hard to do, but what is important to do is to be competent and a good researcher who can look at pre-verbal children up to the age of, say, 18 months and post-verbal children from 18 months onwards. And what we see in developmental psychology is something of a divide, a schism between those two kinds of expertise. So there are some people who spent most of their career um, studying infancy, pre-verbal infants. And conversely, there are many very successful students of cognitive development who've not really studied infancy. But in some ways, that transition, somewhere between 12 months and 13 months, is so remarkable and so dramatic uh, we see, you know, a pre-verbal creature, not so much different from other non-human primates, transformed into something resembling a human being who's already part of a culture who speaks a language, maybe speaks two languages. It's such a, it's such a dramatic transformation that I think we need people who 
are capable and willing to follow it through and to be experts, as I say, in, in both of those age periods. And, but that is, that is a challenge. It's not easy to do that kind of work. You give ideas <laughs> to young scientists and researchers. <laughs> okay, thank so. you. Because <laughs> it's not going to be me. <laughs> thank you, Paul. Dimitris, Pneumatikos, wants to ask. Hi, Paul. Hi there. Nice to see you again. How are you? Nice. Um, nice and I would like to thank you to be here with us and the organizers of this meeting. Uh, I would like to ask you something that um, uh, goes beyond your research, but I think that your expertise and your experience in uh, doing research or uh, trusting uh, testimony, uh, trusting uh, uh, informants, uh, trusting uh, um, about informants about uh, science, even religion and uh, uh, all these uh, supernatural ideas and beliefs. Um, based on all this knowledge that, and the expertise that you have, I would like to ask you to, to help us to, and to discuss with you the, the phenomenon that um, we noticed during the COVID-19. Uh, many of people uh, 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 asked questions about COVID-19, about uh, uh, vaccination, for example, uh, in, in people uh, who are experts, but at uh, the same time, we saw uh, many other informants that um, uh, people are looking for from them to, to help to, to decide about vaccination, for example. Uh, many of them, and there is a lot of evidence uh, indicating that in East and West as well, um, people ask the um, trusted more uh, scientists who were religious than non-religious, and even they asked the uh, religious leaders in order to decide about vaccination. That means that they, uh, they involved religious uh, informants in scientific uh, uh, um, affairs, in, in scientific issues. So how we can explain this based on your expertise and experience that you have uh, from uh, working with children? And of course, we can project this in, uh, in adults as well. I guess the, my broad explanation would be that, you know, as Western educated, overeducated adults, we tend to draw a fairly broad and sharp distinction between science on the one hand and religion on the other. Um, and particularly, for example, in countries like the United States, some political thinking is organized around um, that conflict. I mean, teaching of evolution being a classic example of, of where uh, religion and science have um, confronted each other. On the other hand, um, I'm tempted to say that when we study it from a child development perspective, the way in which children acquire beliefs in scientific entities, such as oxygen, germs, and so forth, and the way in which the child acquires beliefs in religious entities, such as God and the soul, is actually rather similar. And so in that sense, perhaps it's becomes less disconcerting that even among adults, we see them not sharply differentiating between the religious domain and the scientific domain, but thinking of them, thinking of those domains as in some sense conjoined um, and simply approaching them by using, you know, criteria of trustworthiness, prestige, expertise uh, rather than parsing them according to the methods that those experts bring to bear. Um, the methods that those experts bring to bear, we would want to prioritize ourselves 
um, as you know, often secular individuals. But I think um, in some ways we we mislead ourselves into thinking that therefore that's a common strategy. It probably isn't. So I, that's not a full answer to your question, but I think it's the beginnings of an answer that um, ultimately faith in faith in um, religion and faith in science are not so different, not as different as we might expect them to be. It's Anastasia. Anastasia, claro. Yes, uh, uh, Professor Harris, I would like to ask a question. I am uh, uh, coming from the area of uh, disability studies and uh, I would like to focus on the early childhood interventions, especially when we're talking about uh, uh, children with uh, developmental disabilities. Uh, now, I would like to ask, uh, uh, through your uh, scientific uh, experience that you have all these years, uh, what is your opinion about uh, the intensive, interven uh, intensive interventions on uh, cognitive acceleration that uh, take place in early childhood intervention programs? I say that because sometimes I feel that I'm not very sure about their usefulness in a way in inverted commas, but uh, I would uh, highly appreciate it if I can uh, hear your opinion from a child's development point of view. Thank you very much. Well, I think I share some of your hesitation. Um, um, for example, here in Boston, when I listen to the radio, um, there's a company which advertises its curriculum, which is called Tools for the Mind. And this is ultimately a Vygotskyan-inspired enterprise, which allegedly improves children's self-regulation and executive function. And as these things go, I think there's a reasonable amount of evidence suggesting that for some children, such interventions can be um, effective. On the other hand, um, I, there's so much, there's so much evidence, certainly in the United States, and I think in other countries of interventions, which become very popular, and perhaps oversold in terms of their efficacy. Um, I guess I, particularly when we're talking about younger children, I mean, children between three and five or three and six preschoolers or kindergarten, kindergarten children, I'm tempted to think that um, we would do better not to try to find some ex program of acceleration, but to think more carefully about what kind of human beings we want young children to turn into and what aspects of their psychological life we value. And in that sense, I'm tempted to think that the more, as it were, slow education stance that we see in countries like Scandinavia, Norway, Denmark, and so forth, um, which tend to think of early childhood in a more um, as a more protected area, uh, I, I'm without being very scientific about it. I'm much more sympathetic to I'm, <laughs> I'm sympathetic to that slow approach to early childhood rather than the acceleration approach, which tends to be favoured in the United States. Um, I may say I have a good colleague called. Um, Susan Engel, who's busy writing a book about the varieties of early childhood experience in the United the United States. So, I should I shouldn't I shouldn't assume that every preschool education program is the same across the United. There's a huge amount of variation, but the the overall rhetoric uh, 
tends to be uh, one of how to imp how to accelerate and i i have misgivings about that myself yeah i suppose i'm i think young children should be given a chance to linger as well okay thank you very much thank you Um, actually, I have one more question, if I can. Sure. Um, so I, I will return to the uh, notion of dual representations. Um, so your research highlights the intriguing finding that children can hold different beliefs about death, depending on the context, the biological one and the religious one. And you found that the coexistence of these two different uh, concepts of death is not limited to children. We found you found this coexistence to adults too uh, is widespread across different cultures and different religious groups. Um, we have that evidence from uh, reaction time studies that when more sophisticated scientific concepts uh, are learned, uh, they do not replace the non-scientific one um, which initially existed, but the non-scientific continue to exist. So. In the light of this research, is it pertinent to consider whether children um, and adults hold to distinct conceptions of death in a similar manner, or whether um, adults' conceptions are more sophisticated, are reorganized to a more elaborated theoretical framework? And um, I, I wonder if this shifting from uh, one concept to the other, from one representation to the other, is uh, more challenging for uh, children. So do you have any evidence from your research that sheds light on how children think about these two perspectives and whether there are qualitative differences between children and adults? Um, it's a good question. And I I'm currently have a postdoc, Aisha Payir, who's pursuing these issues uh, to do with uh, coexistence. I mean, I'm tempted to say, though, that in the context of death, at least, um, I I don't think that parent that adults, given more time to reflect, mm -hmm. would ultimately say, well, of course, in the end, the biological perspective is the correct one, and it's only on impulse, I believe, in the afterlife. So there do seem to be cases where these two perspectives are not, so to speak, hierarchically arranged. Um, they do, for better or for worse, coexist in some very clear and definite sense. Um, I mean, I suppose it's possible that um, if we looked at it, if we looked at a range of these coexistent thoughts, we would find some developmental changes. Uh, but I'm equally open to the idea that there are not dramatic differences, that children, just as children entertain these two different modes of thinking depending upon the context, so so do adults. Um, so this may be an area where we don't see, I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but we may not see, you know, dramatic qualitative change. But what do you think yourself? Um, I wonder because um, I, I have the biological um, concept. But um, when I lost my mother, um, I felt nice to, to think that perhaps may exist something after life. But I knew that this cannot happen. I mean, I, I had the biological concept. So I wonder, I can think about the two, two different contexts, but I, I wonder if children can think with the same way about these two different concepts of death. So I can reflect on these two concepts, but children, can, can they do it? 
Well, I suppose before I talk about the children, though, I would say that you, your reaction to your mother's death is perhaps not completely representative. After all, there are many people who, in some sense, continue to believe a parent is watching over them. Um, they can communicate with them. And indeed, the work, you know, the the more recent work on grieving, both in children and adults, um, implies that um, far from people, as it were, gradually dissociating themselves emotionally from this attachment figure, that they those bonds are continued. Um, and even continued in a relatively active way with the person, as it were, seeking advice or seeking comfort or thinking about. So I'm trying to say, whilst I accept your own <laughs> example, um, we see lots of we see lots of other examples of the way that people deal with with bereavement. So again, in that sense, um, I'm not sure that development is is in some sense toward the more the more hierarchical or judgmental, so to speak. Yeah. Thank you. Is there any other question? <clears throat> I cannot see. I see that. Yes. As Asimina. As Asimina. Yes. Hello. I was trying to <laughs> post my hand. Thank you for your very interesting talk. I'm really excited that you're talking uh, to us this afternoon. Uh, I had a quick look uh, at your book, um, Child Psychology in 12 Questions. And uh, what grasped my attention in the table of the contents, because I don't have the book in my hand, it's, it's your second chapter, How Do Children Learn Words? Universality and Variation. Could you give us a flavor or expand a bit on this chapter? Um, to be honest, it's that chapter um, is, <clears throat> what can I say? It's intended as a very um, accessible introduction to the study of language acquisition. And I decided I decided to focus on children's acquisition of lexical meaning as one aspect of the much bigger problem of how children acquire language. So in that chapter, I'm afraid there's not much discussion of syntax, for example, um, and little discussion of pragmatics. I just have, in my own experience, found that teaching teaching uh, new students, students just taking child psychology for the first time um, about language, it's dangerous to become too technical too quickly. And very often, when we start talking about the acquisition, particularly of syntax, it becomes quite technical quite quickly. And so rather than rather than putting off students, I decided to focus in on the acquisition of lexical lexical items. And I think in that same chapter, though, there's also a discussion of children's questions. So there's uh, uh, the beginnings of the the you know the expansion of of the child's um, in, interpersonal repertoire, this ability to seek information from from others' testimony. Um, yeah, so there's a very that's a very brief kind of that particular chapter. Okay, because thank you. I 
when I saw the word variation, in my mind came uh, individual differences, and then in my mind came uh, a typical development, a typical language development. So a further question would be how studying a typical language uh, development would inform us about typical language development. I, so that goes right. an idea. I, I do talk to some extent about variation among children and the input that they receive. Of course, there's quite a lot of discussion of of uh, um, the diversity of constructions and language that some children are exposed to as compared to others. And we we know from the last 20, 30 years that that's pretty important for children. So they do naturally learn language, but it depends on the environment. Um, it depends on the environment that they're exposed to as to how rapidly their vocabulary grows, for example. Yeah. Thank you. So Nikos is, has his hand up. Yes. Uh, Paul, uh, during the last uh, years, there is an interesting uh, discussion regarding the relationship between uh, theory of mind and metacognition, uh, especially in uh, uh, developmental level. I would like to have your opinion on this uh, issue. And uh, firstly, and secondly, uh, your opinion uh, about the relationship between these two aspects of uh, awareness and uh, consciousness. My goodness. <laughs> 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 well, I'm not sure exactly what you have in mind when you talk about theory of mind and metacognition. I do know that there's some interesting work going on, particularly in Germany, under the guidance of Beata Sodium and Christoph Osterhaus, looking at connections between the, the, the sophistication of the child's theory of mind and their ability to think more generally about science. If I'm completely candid, I am tempted to say it wouldn't be my choice to go in, go it, go at the question that way. In other words, I'm tempted to say has been a because the theory of mind enterprise has been so engaging, stimulating, and successful. I think there's often been the temptation to say, well, let's take the theory of mind package and push it over here and push it over there. My own temptation is to say, maybe sometimes when you go over there, you better start thinking about what is distinctive about over there, particularly if you're thinking about children's understanding of science. So I myself am, ha, am nervous about the extent to which, um, or hesitant about the extent to which um, the theory of mind um, focus may have been pushed beyond its natural boundaries, let me put it that way. But I'm happy to hear you disagree with me if you wish to. Yeah, it's something that uh, uh... I work on it, and uh, it's really a, a hard issue to give a specific answer. Mm -hmm. um, I believe, in my opinion, both 
are, as I told you before, aspects of uh, awareness about the mind. The one is about mind, gen mind in general or the other mind. And metacognition is focused on uh, one's own mind. And also I believe that uh, these uh, both are aspects of uh, consciousness and uh, both are different developmental aspects of consciousness. And uh, with uh, the common uh, underlying mechanism, uh, the executive functions. But I think that uh, it is a, a serious, it's a very, very difficult to give an answer and uh, it's also a great, great uh, discussion. Um, what, one thing I perhaps would add to my answer is that one, in one way, I think the theory of mind enterprise needs to be deepened and to some extent reworked. So there was a very influential paper by Alison Gottnick published in Behavioral and Brain Sciences, which basically claimed that the child's understanding of other people was no different from the child's understanding of their own mind. Um, so the child's understanding of somebody else's false belief improved in the same way as the child's understanding of their own false belief. Um, ever since then, work on theory of mind has been um, neutral as between first person, second person, and third person. The, the idea is that the child acquires concepts which can apply equally to themselves, to their interlocutor or to an absent third party. And my gut feeling is that that's just wrong. That can't be right. That there are domains in which the child's knowledge of their own mind has a different basis from the child's knowledge of other people's minds. And so I've begun to do some work exploring this this issue. Um, it has a long history in philosophy, um, uh, but I think psychologists ended up too quickly taking one particular route through through the, the conceptual uh, maze, so to speak, this route that was eloquently, I must admit, advocated by Alison Gopnik, but which with which I disagree. But um, I'm, it's too early for me to give you chapter and verse as to <laughs> as to where she exactly she's wrong. But my guts tell me she's wrong. So. <laughs> OK, thank you. I hope that we will have uh, uh, the chance to discuss that again. OK, sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask something? Yes, um, I'm sorry, it's my last question. Um, so you you don't think that, as I understand it, that we, um, we may think that uh, um, uh, there might be uh, common conceptual components between theory of mind and other domains and knowledge on theory of mind may inform our knowledge on other domains. Uh, you refer to, to Bede Sodian and uh, Christopher Osterhaus research. Um, yes. And I wonder if, for example, um, the ability to understand in the social domain that there may be different beliefs, different uh, perspectives, may help us to understand different perspectives, for example, in the physical domain. So, 
I found that children uh, who have a more advanced theory of mind ability uh, may distinguish, distinguish better between appearance and reality um, regarding astronomical phenomena, like, for example, the shape of the Earth and the day night change right. and right. these things. So, as I, I understand it, you don't think that there is a relation between these two domains. Well, I think it's always it's going to be difficult if you have a particular child who's good at both mm. to know whether in some sense it's because of some kind of conceptual transfer from the one domain to the other. You may be dealing with a child who, for whatever reason, is advanced in their thinking in both domains. So I guess we need training experiments. And I don't know if I mean. I, it, this is not, I must admit, this is not an area I'm an expert in, yeah, but I would be tempted to say that um, um, more generally, because we know that transfer is not the child's strengths, but, you know, they typically don't transfer knowledge. <laughs> if you're trying to teach them something about why, the best thing to do is to teach them about why rather than to go at it via X. <laughs> but maybe I'm maybe I'm being prejudiced here and you have some data which <laughs> can show me to be wrong. Thank you. Okay, um, I see there are no more hands up. Um, Okay, um, so uh, I would like to thank you all so much for uh, for all these interesting contributions to to this really beautiful and inspiring uh, meeting. Um, uh, I think uh, it's time to say goodbye. Uh, Professor Harris, it was really wonderful to have you here tonight with us. Uh, we learned a lot. I personally learned a lot. Uh, we thought a lot. And I think uh, we all come out of this meeting uh, a bit richer. Um, thank you very much for being here. Well, thank you. And thank you to those of you who've organized this. And thanks to all of you who've asked such interesting and difficult questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. We really thank you. Yeah. Bye bye now. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Hello, Brady. 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 Ευχαριστούμε πολύ. Καλό βράδυ.